Hi, welcome back everyone to Online Church. I'm really excited to be able to present to you about sugar and you. You know, this topic is something that's going to be really relevant today, especially as we are in this coronavirus lockdown. How much sugar have you been having over these past few weeks whilst you've been locked down at home? Well, you might be surprised to know how much sugar you are supposed to have every day. And also, a lot of people ask me, are artificial sweetness actually okay instead of having sugar? You're going to find out about all of this and more in today's talk. So we're going to jump right in. I'm just going to pull up my slides now. Here we go. We're going to launch right in. So you might be wondering about sugar. Well, let's talk about sugar and let's talk about why we need to be careful about sugar first. So they did a uh, published a study last year in 2019 that said something really interesting. One cup of soft drink a day is linked to an 18% increased risk of cancer. Isn't that amazing? So that means that people who guzzle sugary drinks have a higher risk of developing cancer in a decade-long study involving more than 100,000 people. But is it just soft drinks that are the problem? Are there other sugary drinks that we might consider healthy that also could be problematic? Well, unfortunately, that is true as well. In the same study, they found that fruit juices and sugary drinks are linked to an increased risk of cancer. So unfortunately, it's not just your Coca-Colas, your Pepsis, and your Mountain Juice that are going to be a problem. It's also going to be fruit juices as well. And they looked at 100% fruit juice drinks. Not, your, not just the ones that have a little bit, but your 100% fruit juice drinks also. Now, you might also be thinking, well, maybe it's only just not so good for my physical health, but what about mental health? Well, in another study called the Whitehall Study 2, they looked at the diets and medical conditions of 8,000 people over a 22-year period. By keeping track of uh, diet and doctor visits by participant surveys, and they found that by looking at what participants ate, and the sorts of conditions that they went to their doctor for, the researchers were able to analyze correlations between diet and health outcomes. The one thing that popped out was that men who consume 67 grams or more of sugar per day were 23% more likely to be diagnosed with depression in a five-year period than men who consume less than that. So that begs the question, how much sugar is too much. We're going to get to that very shortly. Did you know that the Bible also mentions something uh, very similar to what studies are showing us today? In Proverbs chapter 25 verse 27, the Bible actually tells us that it is not good to eat too much honey. What is honey? It's a type of sugar. So what is sugar actually? Is sugar all that bad for you? Well, let's do a little bit of background here. So Sugar is actually part of a group of molecules called carbohydrates. Now, all of us need to have carbohydrates in order to in, uh, make sure that our body actually runs. So sugar is just one of these types of molecules. Now, I want to show you what some of the main forms of sugar are as well. Some of the main forms, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but some of the main forms of sugar are glucose, fructose, sucrose, dextrose, maltose, lactose, and starch. So these are some of the main forms of sugar. But what happens as we take sugar? Well, sugar um, activates our limbic reward system. And when our limbic reward system is activated, it releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Some of you might have heard of dopamine before, but it's basically the thing that gets released when our brain wants to tell us to do that action again. So when we have sugar, it comes onto our tongue and then it sends signals to our brain to release dopamine, telling us to, ooh, have some more of that sweet thing. Now, a lot of things can activate our reward system. 
socializing with friends is a very pleasurable activity and it will also activate our limbic reward system and release dopamine as well. Um, unfortunately, things like drugs, heroin, cocaine, all of these will cause a violent rush of dopamine in our system. But alcohol, nicotine, sex, all of these things can also trigger a rush of dopamine in our system too. But you know, sugar does the same, but it's, it doesn't release quite a, such a huge rush of dopamine just like drugs do. So just important to remember that when we keep having these things that trigger such big releases of dopamine in our system, it can lead to loss of control, tolerance and cravings. And that's why people, uh, when they have drugs, they will have to start to have higher and higher and higher levels of those drugs because their brain develops a tolerance. So they need a higher amount of cocaine or a higher amount of uh, heroin in order to produce that same pleasurable response. And here's the kicker, sugar is the same. When we have a lot of sugar into our diet, it, we also build tolerance to sugar as well. And that's why we need sweeter and sweeter things to produce that same release of dopamine into our system as well. But there's not only uh, sugar receptors in our tongue, but there's also sugar receptors lower down in our body as well. And we can find them in our stomach and our gut. And when we have sugar, it causes a, a, a release of insulin, another hormone in the body. And it also produces um, a satiety hormones that tells us we've had enough, thanks. So we've got sugar receptors not only in our tongue, but lower down as well. You know, sometimes when we feel a bit low in energy or a little bit flat, we might want to have that, you know, occasional candy or, or a chocolate bar to bring up our, our, our sugar levels. But as you can see here on this graph, that if we keep having this repeatedly, our blood sugar levels will rise up and that will trigger a release of insulin in our body. And when we have um, insulin, that will drop down the blood sugar levels because that's what insulin is supposed to do. Insulin is supposed to tell our body's cells to take in sugar to reduce the amount of sugar in our blood. And guess what happens when our blood sugar is too low? We'll get that craving for sugar again. And so we have something sweet and our blood sugar levels spike up. And guess what happens? It tells our body to release insulin to bring down the sugar level once again. Now, if this keeps ha happening when we have very high sugar foods or drinks for that matter, we have this blood sugar level roller coaster that keeps going up and down, up and down. And interestingly, studies that link high sugar with greater risk of depression is actually because of this very issue, because of this blood sugar level roller coaster that we're having. So what we really want is like that green line on the graph. We want instead to have a more consistent level of sugar released into our system. And that's why we have high glycemic index foods and low glycemic index foods or high GI and low GI foods. High GI foods will cause that spike and low GI foods will actually release the sugar in a more even way so we don't have these blood sugar level roller coasters all the time. But you know, if you've been to your dentist uh, recently in the past six months, you might have uh, been told by a dentist that having too much sugar can rot your teeth. Well, the reason for that is because the bacteria that cause cavities love sugar. And so if we have a lot of sugary foods in our mouth, those bacteria will thrive and grow. And because they love to hang around in your mouth, they'll cause cavities and you have something quite similar to what we see here up on the screen. What a very pretty picture indeed. You know, eating sugar has been shown to increase inflammation in our body. And you might be thinking, why is that a big deal? Why is inflammation such a problem? Well, in, uh, in a relatively recent Time article, uh, it was on the front cover, the secret killer. What is the secret killer? Inflammation. Inflammation has links with heart attacks, cancer, and also Alzheimer's disease as well. And so inflammation is a really big problem. And we want to reduce our levels of chronic and ongoing inflammation in our body. The Arthritis Foundation also lists sugar as a food ingredient that causes inflammation. And the reason why it does so is that sugar releases inflammatory messengers called cytokines into our bloodstream. 
But not only that, sugar causes other problems as well. Sugar is converted into your liver uh, by fat. Uh, sorry, sugar is converted by your liver into fats known as triglycerides. A high sugar diet leads to more production of these triglycerides in your liver, which over time leads to what we call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Here's the thing. We used to think that fatty liver um, was pretty much only caused by alcohol. And it's true. Alcohol does lead to a fatty liver. But you can have a fatty liver without drinking a drop of alcohol. And unfortunately, one of those things is sugar. This is characterized by fat being deposited into the liver, which can lead to inflammation in the liver, otherwise known as hepatitis. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can also cause insulin resistance to develop in our bodies as well, which is one of the major driving forces for developing diabetes. You know, high blood sugars over time can cause all sorts of damage, which is why diabetes is such a deadly disease. Diabetes at the end stage will cause kidney failure, blindness, loss of nerve function. It also dramatically increases your risk of suffering from a heart attack or stroke as well. You might be thinking, so are, are people deliberately adding sugar into my food or my drink in order to make me consume it? Well. I want to introduce to you uh, this particular drink known as Dr. Pepper. Some of you may have heard of this drink, very popular in the United States of America. Possible to get it in Australia as well, but less popular here. Now, Dr. Pepper, as an example, when they were researching this drink, they tested over 60 different samples and ran more than 3,000 tests to find what we call the bliss point. Now, the bliss point is basically the point in which a drink or a food is not too sweet because that would be sickly, but also sweet enough to be not um, as uh, less sugary as we think. So when we take something, we might think, oh, that could use a little bit more sugar or that's really too sickly sweet. So that perfect point where it's not too sweet, not too uh, and, and sweet enough is what we call the bliss point. They ran thousands of tests in order to perfect and find the bliss point of this particular drink. Now, they did a, a, an experiment on rats. They took 43 rats, and you can see here there are two different tubes here. And in one tube, um, there was water mixed with cocaine. And in the other tube, what do you think the water was mixed in that one? You guessed it. It was mixed with sugar. And they wanted to see which ones the rats would pick more. Here's the kicker. Three out of the 43 rats chose the, sh the water that was mixed with cocaine. And 40 out of 43 rats chose the water that was mixed with sugar instead. So the rats worked harder for sugar water than cocaine water. You might be thinking, why? Why would they do that? And the reason is because you get endorphins, opioids, and dopamine released in your brain when you have sugar. And so that's why the rats worked harder for sugar than they did for cocaine. But you might be wondering, well, why is it that, you know, so many people talk way more about fat than sugar. Well, the reason is this. You might recognize this man here in the picture. This man um, in the wheelchair that you can see, his name is President Eisenhower. So he was one of the presidents of the United States of America. Now, in 1955, President Eisenhower suffered a heart attack. And so he ordered um, the groups of scientists of America at the time to find out what cause, what is the one of the major causes of heart attacks. And so as these scientists research and research and research, they quickly fell into two camps. First camp said it's fat that causes heart attacks. And the second camp said, no, it's sugar that causes heart attacks. Well, I, I don't think you need to be well versed in history to know which camp won. Yes, you probably guessed it. It was the fat camp that won in the end. 
Eventually, the researchers concluded that it was fat that was the real main factor for causing heart attacks. But today, we know that it's actually really both that contribute to a person having heart attacks. It can be fat, it can be sugar. Now, not for one moment saying that it's okay to have too much fat. No, that's absolutely not the case. We need to be balanced in our approach. The reality is if you have too much fat and too much sugar, you're going to be at a higher risk of developing heart attacks as well. It just so happened that fat was the one that was demonized and sugar just sort of fell by the wayside and people didn't talk very much about sugar as being one of the potential causes of heart attacks as well. Now, how much sugar are you supposed to have then? Well, up on the screen. According to the World Health Organization, you are supposed to have six teaspoons of sugar per day. Six teaspoons. That's it. Now, you might be thinking, all right, how much is six teaspoons? Well, six t a single teaspoon is equivalent to four grams of sugar. So if you were to calculate that into weight, into grams, six teaspoons is equal to 24 grams of sugar okay so that's it that's how much sugar you're supposed to have you might be thinking okay i think i might uh, be within that but here's a really amazing and quite frankly shocking statistic the average australian eats a whopping 40 teaspoons not 40 grams 40 teaspoons of sugar per day that's an incredible 160 grams of sugar. That's, that's just mind-blowing when you think about it. When you compare that to how much you're supposed to have, you're supposed to have six teaspoons. Most Australians have 40, which is 160 grams of sugar. Think that's not you? I advise you to think again. Unfortunately, when we look at supermarket items, 80% of supermarket items that you find there contain added sugar of some description, which means it's very hard for us to stay within the limit unless you're deliberately looking out for it. So what are some things that you might find as uh, being listed as sugar in the ingredients list? Well, our next slide will show you that there are many different names for what we call sugar. You can have a look. Raw sugar is one of them. Dextrose, fructose, glucose, golden syrup, honey, maple syrup, sucrose, malt, maltose, evaporated cane juice, mannose. The list goes on and on. But really, all of these things are one thing. And that one thing is sugar. So let's have a look at some of the content of some common household items. Let's start with the treats. These are the things that we all know are you know, quote unquote, unhealthy, the sometimes food. So a single Cadbury dairy milk chocolate bar, one, one bar has 28.6 grams of sugar. So you can blow your sugar, daily sugar intake in one chocolate bar alone. A single chupa chup has 7.6 grams of sugar. That's almost two teaspoons. Arnott Tim Tams, how many of you only have two Tim Tams at any one time? Not sure many people do, but let's say you had a lot of self-control and you had just two Tim Tams. Well, those two Tim Tams have 16.6 .6 grams of sugar, a little bit more than four teaspoons. And your Magnum, 23.1 grams of sugar. So that one Magnum ice cream is just about ready to blow your sugar intake for the day. Not quite, but almost there. What about breakfast cereals? You might be thinking, okay, I eat pretty healthy breakfast. Well, have a look at this. 5 a.m. apple crumble granola, one cup of granola, 20.5 grams of sugar. Uncle Toby's quick oats. We think, yeah, quick oats, pretty, pretty healthy. A single cup, 12.5 grams of sugar. You could very easily blow your sugar daily intake in breakfast alone. Now, Wheat bix fantastic. Two biscuits of wheat bix one gram of sugar. That's like a quarter of a teaspoon. Fantastic. Healthy choice. Kellogg's Corn Flakes, pretty good as well. Single cup of Kellogg's Corn Flakes, 2.8 grams of sugar. That's under a teaspoon. Great option. What about some so-called um, health foods? These are some popular health foods that are supposed to be healthy for you. An all-natural bakery banana oat slice. 20.1 grams of sugar in a single slice. 
Go Natural Yogurt, Fruit and Nut Delight, 20.6 grams of sugar. And Chobani, Fat-Free Strawberry Greek Yogurt, probably seen these in the, in the dairy food section, 18.9 grams of sugar in there. That's a lot of sugar. And here's the really big one, Boost Juice. How many of you had a Boost Juice recently? Boost Juice, have a look at this. Not a large size, a medium size of Boost Juice, 63. 0.5 grams of sugar that's 14 teaspoons of sugar in there if you thought boost juice was healthy for you i highly encourage you to think again there's so much sugar in there why because all those juices when they blend it all up the sugar is released from the fiber of that particular fruit and that sugar then becomes a really high gi uh, drink when you drink it your blood sugar will spike because you're not chewing and digesting the fruit that you're eating It's been blended up and the sugar has been separated from its fiber and that's why it's so unhealthy And that's one of the reasons why fruit juices are considered unhealthy as well Condiments Heinz ketchup 20 mil not a lot really when you think about it 5.4 grams of sugar barbecue sauce even worse 7.6 grams of sugar in 20 mils honey mustard salad dressing 4.4 grams and sweet and sour sauce 8.5 grams of sugar friends have a think about how much sauce you're adding on to your foods in the future now we coca-cola had to come up at some point in time and here it is coca-cola one can of coke 40 four zero grams of sugar some of you drink the bottle which is even more 600 ml bottle 64 grams of sugar that's just like drinking a boost juice 14 teaspoons that's unbelievable gatorade you might think Gatorade's a, a slightly healthier option, 36 grams of sugar. You're blowing way above your daily recommended sugar intake, having a single Gatorade. Vitamin water, we wouldn't think vitamin water's that bad. It doesn't taste that sweet. 27 grams of sugar in a single 500 ml bottle. And Red Bull, 250 mils of Red Bull in a single can, 27 grams of sugar in that can of Red Bull. Avoid these drinks at all costs. Now, a little, another little slide here. I've spoken a lot about um, sugary drinks already. The short answer is, my friends, don't go for these sugary drinks. They contain way more sugar than you should have in a single day. So I highly encourage you to not have them at all. It's just so hard to, to really control it because you know, it's when we eat something, we, we feel like we're having a lot, but when you drink something, it's very, very different. So artificial sweetness, are they good for you or not? Well, let's have a look at what the studies show us. Uh, research in 2019 revealed that drinking two or more cans a day of um, diet soft drinks, so drinks that have no sugar, but artificial sweetness, increases your risk of stroke by a quarter and heart disease by a third and compared with people who never touch these diet soft drinks the risk of early death is 16 percent higher than those who do um, do not drink diet soft drinks at all so researchers believe that one of the reasons for this is that consuming diet fizzy drinks in high quantities can actually damage blood vessels and lead to chronic inflammation. Here's that killer again, inflammation. So by having artificial sweetness, you can actually still promote inflammation in your body. Artificial sweetness have also been found to boost your appetite and it actually makes you want to eat more and that could put you at a higher risk of developing problems like obesity and diabetes. Australian researchers actually found that when sweetness and energy were outbalanced, because the reality is when you have an artificial sweetener, it tastes sweet, but you're getting zero calories from there. When, when we have this mismatch between sweetness and energy for a long period of time, it sends a signal in our brain to increase the amount of calories that are actually consumed. It's also possible that these products, these artificial sweetness, change the way that we 
taste food. And the reason is because these artificial sweetness are way more potent than actual sugar. And so by overstimulation of these uh, sugar receptors, it may limit our tolerance for more complex tastes. So we tend to find less intensely sweet foods like fruits, for example, less appealing and unsweet foods like vegetables, downright unpalatable. You just don't even want to eat it at all. So I would highly advise you to stay away from the artificial sweetness. Now, let's have a look at um, how to read nutritional labels. So have a look up here on your screen and I'll show you here um, that we can look at it in one of two different ways. We can look at it in the per serve um, column or the per 100 gram column. Now, if you happen to know how much a serve is and you're going to stick to that serve, then you can certainly scroll down to the carbohydrate section and look at the amount of sugar. So, for example, we're looking at a cereal in this particular case, and you see that one serve has 3.5 grams of sugar, which you might think is actually not that bad, and it isn't. But when you have a look at the serving size, you realize that the serving size is 30 grams, which is two-thirds of a cup. Now, the reality is most people don't just have two-thirds of a cup of cereal for breakfast. So you have to be really careful when you look at the serving size that you are actually going to eat that amount of that particular food. Now, if it happens to be like a, a, a small tub of yogurt, one serving size is actually the whole tub, which is fine. Then you can just look at the per serve section to find out exactly how much sugar that you're getting. But sometimes it's really hard to tell, and then it's worthwhile to look at the per 100 gram section, and you look down um, to the sugar section again, and you see how much sugar there is. So how much is too much, you might be wondering. This is where our next section um, talks about what is considered uh, the best choice, sometimes choice, and a poor choice. So we follow a traffic light system, you know, green, amber, and red. So the best choice for sugar, we're talking about sugar in this particular case, less than five grams of sugar per 100 grams. Remember, this is per 100 grams. Less than five grams of sugar per 100 grams, fantastic. Feel free to eat loads of that. Uh, sometimes foods, five to 15 grams per 100 grams would be a, a sometimes food. And a poor choice would be more than 15 grams of sugar per 100 grams. So that means it's more than 15% sugar. So you might wanna reconsider how much you have. So we follow traffic light. Green, go right ahead. Amber, you might wanna slow down and if it's red, just, just stop. Stop having those foods. Now, you might be thinking, how can I remember all of these different things? Well, thankfully, you don't have to remember all those numbers if you're not a numbers person. We live in a smartphone uh, world at the moment. You can download an app for just about everything. It wouldn't surprise you to find out there's an app for that as well. There's an app called Food Switch, which is a free app. You can download it from Google Play Store or the Apple App Store, and you can um, scan with this app the barcode of whatever it is that you're looking at to find out whether it's the green, amber, or red. A better choice, sometimes choice, or a poor choice. And so you are able to, without having to remember the numbers, figure out whether this is a good option for me to have on a regular basis or not. So, you know, my friends, my purpose is not to make you all feel bad about how much sugar that you're having. My purpose today is really to empower you to make the right decisions regarding sugar in your household. Remember, sugar is not evil. You can have a, a small amount of it, no problems at all. But the reality is a lot of us are, could be addicted to sugar and not really realize it at all. You know, sugar addiction is really a nationwide epidemic. And so we need to be aware of it. And now you know how to beat it. But you know, just to wrap up, there's one thing that you can't get enough of, and it is sweeter than sugar. And what is that? That's the Bible, my friends. Our slide here at the end, Psalms 119 verse 103. How sweet are your words? That's God's words, the Bible, to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. I'm so glad that you can't have too much of the Bible. 
You know, you can't get sick of the Bible. You know, you're not going to have really poor blood sugar levels when you read too much of the Bible. My friends, this is the one thing that you can't have too much of. And I'm really glad um, that we have something that we can always turn to, especially during these difficult times, a place where we can read something full of words of comfort, full of words of hope. And so, my friends today, you know what to do now. You have the tools to find out how to overcome this problem that you may not have even realized that you had before and you have the tools to beat it as well. And if you're really struggling, turn to the Bible for help. The Bible is going to be able to help you through anything that you need. I look forward to joining you again uh, next week on Sunday. And we're going to talk about a different topic. Dr. Aaron Ko is going to talk to you about mental health and developing resilience. So I hope that you can join us for an exciting topic next week on how to build your resilience during these difficult times. I'll see you at 10 o'clock on next Sunday. Thank you very much.